Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Elizabeth, and this is episode one. The theme today is, so you want to own a horse. This is basically going to be the top five things you need to consider before you decide to actually purchase a horse. And when I was three, Cooper was always way too slow for me. I decided to ride the minis that were in the pasture next to him uh, at a full sprint with no saddle. (laughs) So... I eventually had to give him up when we decided to move from New Hampshire to North Carolina. He was just simply way too old to make the move. And when I was 15, I actually got my first horse again. His name was Bo, and we actually got pretty lucky when we decided to purchase him. He was about 400 bucks. We got him out of someone's backyard pasture in the middle of the night. When he actually got to our our house, he was covered in burrs. His hair was matted, his tail was matted, and he was just generally a very messy looking boy. But I can easily say he was the best teacher, and as a result, I learned so much from him. He taught me a lot about perseverance and sticking with it even when things were tough. And it was pretty tough for me in the beginning because... He had a habit of standing with his head in a tree, and my mother's favorite thing to bring up to me was when he stood with his head in a bush for close to an hour, and I was trying everything I could to get him out of that bush. I was kicking him, I was trying to turn him one way or the other, and I was about to get off when my mother finally stood there and said, if you get off that horse, I'm going to sell him. So I had to learn how to get his head out of the bush and swallow my pride, and I decided to start taking lessons because 15-year-olds are pretty bullheaded, and I thought I didn't need lessons. I knew everything there was to know about riding. Well, flash forward to post-college Jordan, and post-college Jordan (laughs) decided to purchase a off-track thoroughbred mare named Torliani, affectionately named Noodles by all the little kids because none of them could say Torliani without saying Tortellini. So the name Noodles was incepted. Um, she was quite the hot-tempered mare. She was moody, sassy. Loved her to death, though. She was a also an excellent teacher. I learned a lot from training her that I brought to a lot of horses that I worked with post with post-owning her. She was very sensitive to your hands. She had a lot of sensitivity there. She was also weary of your leg. If you touched her with your leg, she was going to shoot off from underneath you. And as a evenly (laughs) hot-tempered 20-year-old, she was very difficult for me to deal with. She really taught me to control my temper and learn to understand the inner workings of a horse. There's no, you're not just on the back of a horse. You're also working towards a partnership with the horses underneath you. And she really taught me that. Now, both of those horses are actually retired and still in my ownership. Bo is getting fat and happy in a pasture. And Noodles actually has retired to a, I believe he's 10 years old now. And all she does now is trail rides, and she jumps very small jumps for him. And she is a far cry from the horse that I got when she was seven. She's now, gosh, I guess she's ten now. God, I can't believe the time has passed so fast. But anyways, let's get into the nitty-gritty here. These are the top five things you should consider before you decide to purchase a horse. So first off, what will you do with this horse? What is your passion? Do you like trail riding? Do you like competing? Do you like competing for fun? Do you like to compete for the blue ribbons? All of these things are things you need to consider. I got Bo with the intent to learn how to ride, and I eventually wanted to compete on him and do some crazy things with him, but as I learned, Bo had a lot of constrictions. He had some lower leg issues. I mean, we got pretty lucky for him being a backyard horse, but he had a lot of issues. He's probably got some navicular damage at this point. He's just an old man the ripe age of 15. <laughs> I know, sounds pretty young, but he's uh, got some issues, so that's why he's getting fat in a pasture and is a happy boy. I decided to not compete him anymore after he just simply really did not enjoy 
training and competition. He just didn't enjoy it. He didn't like the show ring. It's a totally different atmosphere. So he didn't like to do that. So when you consider buying a horse, you have to consider, do you want to compete or do you want to just relax and enjoy being on a horse? Next up is that you guys need to be honest about your abilities. If you are a seasoned professional, maybe not a professional, but a seasoned working student, and you've decided that you're ready to make that transition from lesson horses to having your own project horse or even a horse for a lifetime, you need to consider your skill level. Then when you're considering skill level, do you need a trainer? The answer here is yes. Everybody needs a trainer. <laughs> even Charlotte Desjardins, a three-time gold medalist, most recently in 2016 at the Rio Games, she takes lessons. She does clinics. She teaches. So she's constantly keeping those training ideals in the back of her brain. She comments about taking lessons with Carl Hester on regular occasion and all sorts of things like that. So that's something you definitely need to consider. You can't be saying that you are a professional trainer and deciding to go out there and adopt a off-track thoroughbred when you're not quite ready to handle that kind of temperament. Next thing is, do you have the time allocation that the horses will require. So horses take up a lot of your time. If you're not able to be out there every single day with them, you need to consider alternative options to horse ownership. This is the reason why I don't even have a horse right now that's in my care physically. Bo is with my parents getting fed every single day. Like I said, fat and happy. Noodles is being leased out because she needs a job. She can't just sit every day and do nothing. If she was to do that, she would probably easily lose her mind. She has that temperament that doesn't handle low levels of work very well. Like I said, she's very hot-headed. She doesn't like it. How many days of the week can you actually go out to the barn and devote two to four hours to taking care of your horse. Let's break this down. So when you go out to the barn, say you're already dressed. Don't even add that into the equation. Grooming your horse should at least take 30 minutes, at least. Then say you do 15 to 20 minutes warm up and you do 15 to 20 minutes of riding. Then you gotta do at least five to 10 minutes of cool down to ensure that your horse is pretty comfortable. That's 20, 20, and 10 at minimum. So you're up to almost an hour of just ride time. So you're up to an hour and 30 minutes. Then let's get into post care. So that's at least 30 minutes, sometimes even 45 minutes because post care is equally as important as pre-care for your riding. Post care, you have to hose down the legs. You have to curry up the sweat marks that your horse may have. You have to leave your horse in better condition than when you found them. If you leave your horse in anything less, you run the risks of issues coming up later. That's just something to consider for you guys. Some people are happy going to the barn once or twice a week, while many others, like several of my friends, they would much rather go out as often as they can to ensure that they are truly integrating the horse into their life. The people that are going out every single day are really trying to consider all the aspects of the horse. They're considering their temperament, their training level, and what they need. With that being said, let's go ahead and get into number four. So this breaks down into what kind of temperament do you actually need in your horse? And this takes into consideration the other three topics as well. So what do you do, what skill level, and the time devoted. So temperament runs into, is your horse hot-headed, level-headed, works well when they're going every single day? Do they need days off? Some horses do need days off or else they will lose their minds. Some horses want to work every single day. I actually have a friend who jokingly tells me that her horse has turned into a dragon if it's had two to three days off. Coincidentally, that horse is actually a mare. So for all you mare owners out there that are listening, you guys understand the struggle there. You also need to consider your skill level here. The seasoned professional might be able to handle a horse with a hot temperament. They are also going to be able to handle a horse with a level temperament. Then you also have to consider your preferences. Like me, I don't like to go to the barn and have the exact same horse every day. I would lose my mind if the horse was the exact same every single day. 
So I need a horse that kind of tosses in a wrench every now and then. When I had Noodles, she was obviously a mare. And when you have a mare, they're just like a woman. They got their cycles going on. So some days I'd go out there and she'd be nice and happy. I could have her on a nice loopy rein and she'd be happy as can be plopping along with a warm up. Then there would be those cold windy days when she would prick up her tail and throw in a couple of bucks just for fun. You have to be able to consider that. You need to make sure that your temperament is equal to your horse's temperament. If you can't control your temper, one, you need to learn how to control your temper if you're going to ride horses. And two, you have to be able to find a horse that can kind of deal with those cycles. If you have a bad day, don't be afraid to try and find a horse that can handle some awkward days from you. A lot of um, trainers will also tell, also be really honest with you about this kind of stuff. If you think you need a horse with a, with a hot temperament, or if you can handle a horse with a hot temperament, talk to whatever trainer you're working with or a, tra a trainer who knows your riding style and get their opinion on that. I am a avid, I'm an advocate for finding people that will give you their honest opinion. And that's something I aim to give you, give to you here on this podcast. All right, I'm going to get into my last topic, which is easily the most important topic to consider when you're going to go buy a horse. And that is, what is your budget? It is a running joke in the horse industry that the cheapest part about buying a horse is the actual price tag. I've known $80,000 horses that have ultimately cost their owners way more in the long run due to freak accidents or injuries happening and between saddle fitting and buying new saddles, horses get expensive very fast. Granted, if you're just wanting to be a trail rider, you can find a good grade quality horse. Grade means they don't actually have paperwork. They don't have registration papers. They don't know who their mom and dad is kind of thing. You can find a good grade horse. That was good old Bo. He was 400 bucks and he would ultimately be an excellent trail horse. He's very chill. You pull him out of the pasture after five months of no work and he's the same exact horse. You can drop him to the buckle and he's just going to plop along. He teaches lessons for beginners even after months off from work and I'd trust him with a grandmother on him. He is the chillest horse ever. But then if you're wanting to compete you and really compete, I'm not talking your local shows. If you're wanting to compete and really compete at the higher levels generally and I'm saying generally because there are those freak moments where people find Cheap horses that end up having a lot of talent. Case in point is Snowman and Harry. Harry found this plow horse that ended up having an excellent ability to be a show jumper and took the show jumping world by storm. Um, there's those people that get lucky like that, but generally, highly competitive horses will cost you the money. Talent costs money, training costs money, breeding costs money. So a lot of people don't take that into consideration. They hope that they can buy this cheap off-track thoroughbred. Like, I tried that with noodles. I paid, I think, two grand for it, and I had this idea that she was going to be my big competition horse, that she was going to be amazing. We were going to go to the, you know, go to the Land Rover. Oh, sorry. Sorry, not Land Rover. It's actually the Kentucky, the Kentucky um, three-day event now. Um, and I always hoped that I would compete with her there. Obviously, that has not happened. She is now with her little boy who loves her dearly. So you have to take that in consideration. If you want to compete at a high level, your horse is going to be more expensive, and you have to consider that budget. Now we get into the hard part, actual care of the horse. Now this also goes into what do you do with the horse, what do you want to do, what's the horse's temperament. So the actual care of the horse is also highly variable compared to everything else, okay? So... If you don't have a lot of time to devote to your horse, you're going to have to consider boarding costs. And depending on where you live, boarding costs are on a sliding scale. So what that means is I can find a boarding barn in my area that costs 125 bucks, And if I have the time, 
I can go out and feed the horse myself. For 125 bucks, they'll give it hay and a place to sleep, and I have to feed it every day. Or you run into the case of what's called a full-service boarding barn. So what these people do is for a larger fee, these people will take care of your horse for you, feed it, groom it on occasion, put its blanket on during the winter time, take the blanket off when it gets too warm, put their fly sheets on in the summer if your horse needs it, do routine checks on the horse for you, and even sometimes they will train the horse for you. That's something you need to consider as well. If you're boarding your horse, you might need to train it under the head trainer so that it will continue to stay into work so it gets keeps that good temperament for you. With that being said, your horse is getting training and getting boarded. You need to consider the costs of lessons. Trust me, you need them. Everyone needs lessons. When I was under the title of professional, I was taking lessons every single day, sometimes two to three times a day. So always consider the lessons cost, even if you just do one every other week. I know some of my friends have done this sort of thing where they'd go to the barn and if the trainer was out there, they'd they'd work with them and have a lesson with them and they'd pay for the one-off lesson here and there just to keep their education going. You'll learn that as you go through the horse industry, keeping your education going and understanding that the more you know, the less you actually know, that will help you immensely in your journey through the horse world. And so next up, after you've considered your board and the cost of actually purchasing your horse, next you got to consider farrier. So no hoof, no horse. If you don't have a good farrier and you're not paying for quality farriership, that can cost a lot of money in the long run. While it seems like some farrier costs can be a lot, you have to consider that a little money here can save you a lot of money long term. Don't think short term. $20 trims are nice, but you also have to consider that that $20 trim, the horse's foot might get weird, and that's something I'll get into in a later episode, but things can happen very easily inside that horse's hoof wall and it can be detrimental and even catastrophic if it's done incorrectly. This can also lead to corrective shoeing which costs way more and I've even known people that have paid $250 a shoeing every four to six weeks. So consider that on top of your say $500 vet bills sorry, not vet bills, say $500 boarding costs plus the $30,000 price tag on your horse, and you're going up and up and up and up. Next up, I just mentioned it, your regular vetting costs money as well. So you start with your vaccines. Some are yearly, some are six months, some are three months. If you're competing and you're moving to other states and shows, they have to be done more regularly. And sometimes you need state-specific vaccines. I'll get into that once again at a later episode, hopefully. And you have to work with your vet as well to know what costs are coming to you. You also have to have your Coggins. Every good horse person always prays for a negative Coggins. Has to be negative or else your horse is going to have to go to a quarantine facility, which is absolutely awful and luckily doesn't happen very often but Coggins is a yearly thing has to happen on the clock every year if you want to move your horse anywhere also coming into the vet bills horses are completely accident prone and some breeds are typically and I say typically because there are the outliers they're typically accident prone let's be real here they're they're very fragile creatures there are such emergencies like colic Every single horse person is terrified of the word colic. It's where a horse has an upset belly, and because horses can't regurgitate whatever's in their stomach, they end up building up gas, which can be life-threatening for them. And it is the scariest thing that comes up with horse people. So we've gone through your cost of board, your cost of the horse, cost of farrier, and your cost of vetting. Next comes the more regular costs. You have to get into feeding your horse, of course. You want to have a fat and healthy horse, and some horses are easier keepers versus your harder keepers, as we like to call them, which is your quarter horses versus your average thoroughbreds. 
it's kind of a common knowledge that quarter horses kind of stay fat off of air and thoroughbreds you have to pour a lot of food into them because they have really high strong temperaments and really fast metabolisms. You have to consider how much that's going to cost because higher quality feeds cost higher prices. You also have to consider how much your hay costs and depending on your region that's going to change. Around my area, generally I pay $3 a bale from the field. So that's from the field. I have to go out into the field, pick it up myself. If I want it delivered, it gets up to $5, $6 a bale. And if you're getting 100, 100 bales, you're getting up to $600 per load that they bring to you. So if you're getting close to 300 bales, it stacks up pretty fast. Granted, if you get that many right off the bat, you're kind of stockpiled for a little while, depending on how many horses you have. So with that being said, if you do have a limited budget, there are options for you. First off, you can start off by just simply taking lessons and enjoying being around horses. A lot of barn owners will accept that there are people that can't quite afford to actually have a horse, and they just want to be out and about at the barn, seeing the horses, meeting them. Just It's a different kind of feel when you get to just stay around the barn, and we completely understand that. The next tier up is taking multiple lessons a week. You know, the people that come out and take two to three lessons a week, they get to have that little bit more in-depth feel. The next step up from that is what we all like to call the working student or the work to ride for the adult amateurs. With that, you go out and you clean some stalls. You just do basic barn work, which is always plentiful. There's always a need for someone to come help clean stalls and hay the horses and groom them and all that sort of stuff. So they will generally trade your time taking care of the horses for them for some rides on their less ridden horses. I know we had a program where if the pony clubbers would come out and clean stalls in the morning, they'd get to ride a horse right around lunchtime when we were closing down for lunch. We'd, we'd sit around, eat our lunches, and let the kids ride. They loved it. It was such a high incentive for them that they really enjoyed it. They were happy to come out and do the do chores just so they could ride. So see if any barns in your area actually do offer that. Don't be obnoxious with it and annoy them because they do have a very busy schedule. But just see if they have that option available to you. And most of them will have something available. While some of them, if they're the higher Higher end barns generally have their own string of working students working there. So just take that into consideration as well. The highest tier you can get to basic horse ownership without all of the major costs that are involved is leasing a horse. So the barn I used to work at, you could half lease a horse, which means you paid a little bit less and you get to ride the horse twice a week, once in a lesson, once in what we call the hack ride. So the hack ride was a unmonitored lesson or unmonitored ride with the horse where you got to go around the ring, walk around the fields, depending on the weather, and just enjoy being on your horse. And then the other one was a true lesson. Me or the head instructor were there teaching you how to ride this horse so that you could take this information into your hack ride. You got to have a lesson and a hack ride, and that was what a lot of people really enjoyed. That was enough for them. They just wanted the two days where they could go out to the barn and forget life. Then there was the people that full leased. Now with this, they actually got the horse technically every single day of the week. We had a thing that we did where if the person couldn't come out, we'd make sure their horse got into a lesson somehow so they got ridden. So that worked out really well for a lot of people. Like for me, an example that I have was I got my start with braiding tails at a barn. And because I braided so many tails and put a lot of effort into braiding those tails, I got to ride horses. I eventually got to where I could, I had my own horses, so I didn't have the option to full lease a horse. I got it to where I would work so much that I could put my horse at the barn I was staying at. That worked out really well for me because it gave me an arena and lessons. So if you can talk to the professionals, they have a lot of options available to you. You're not just stuck. They're usually easy easy to figure out terms and conditions and they will find a way that works for you. Granted, you may have to figure out where you want to go. There are high-end barns that cost more, not necessarily lower-end barns, but 
you know, the more middle ground barns that are more open, more homey feeling. Some are high competition, so they don't need people coming in and out. You just have to really take that into consideration and figure out the type of atmosphere that you want in a barn. With that being said, horses are quite a big commitment. I touched on just five things you should consider before, before you buy a horse. Not even when you're going to buy a horse. These are before you decide to buy a horse. So that would be what would you do, honesty about your abilities, the time allocation you can give, the temperament you need, and what is your budget. With that being said, it is a big commitment, and you have to take that in consideration. There are huge rewards, though. It's very rewarding when you finally get that transition done, when your horse pricks their ears up and nickers at you. It's crazy how many rewards you truly get and how uplifting having a horse is. It's something that I truly wish everybody could experience. It's a totally different light feeling. So I'm going to go ahead and start to close this out. I want to just let you guys know that we are on all of the social media accounts. We are all under Clopcast or Clopcast Podcast. If you guys have any suggestions or topic ideas, shoot them on over in an email to clopcastpodcast at gmail.com. I hope you guys have fun out of the barns and kiss a lot of pony noses. And I will see you guys next time.